Welcome. Um, I am Marilyn Ness. My pronouns are she, her. I am wearing a flowery um, shirt uh, and sitting in my bedroom in New York City, which is currently under construction. So we apologize for any inadvertent noise. This is COVID times. Um, I'm, I'm handing it to. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Susan Margolin, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm in New York City as well. Um, and I am wearing, I'm a, uh, I guess, um, later middle aged white woman wearing a, I don't know what you would call this, kind of like a purplish shirt and a um, whitish sweater with blonde brown curly hair. And I have glasses. I'm also middle-aged, brown hair, shoulder length. And both Susan and I are coming from the tribal lands of the Lenape. We are the co-chairs for the DPA's documentary Waterfall Committee, who helped shepherd these guidelines into existence with a committed team of volunteers. They were released in 2020. We also want to thank Maureen Ryan, who created our teaching curriculum, and Risa Sander Weir for running our Teach the Teachers program and brought you all here with us today. Um, so just to explain the format of the seminar, um, you should have received the DPA waterfall guidelines or found them on our website ahead of time. Um, it is helpful to read the guidelines before diving in on this seminar so you have some familiarity. If the people joining the webinar in the future haven't, we suggest you stop the webinar and come back once you've had a chance to review the guidelines. Normally, we would poll the audience to see who has worked with investment financing before to get a sense of the room. We pre-polled our audience today and 78% reported being new to investment financing. So if you're looking for a primer, you've come to the right place. Um, our, our poll also frequently reveals that most participants have worked deferred or unpaid on at least one or more projects in their career. A norm we can all agree is unsustainable and one the DPA would like to change. The construction has begun. Um, this document, the Waterfall Guidelines, were created by the Documentary Producers Alliance. We are a five-year-old organization set up to address career sustainability challenges affecting documentary filmmakers and is now focused on issues pertaining to wage and labor practices, structural inequality in our field, the scarcity of development funds, producer recognition, and the relationship between investors and filmmakers. It's grassroots and proactive work towards important change. Uh, two years ago, the best practices in documentary, documentary crediting guidelines came out um, and they were then soon followed the next year by the waterfall guidelines. One note before we start, several times during the presentation, we'll mention that something is DPA recommended and that is because it's new for the documentary financing world. We wanna mention it each time so that you are aware if you go into an investor conversation and you get pushback, it's because it may be different from what people have been used to doing in the past. So we are introducing some new ideas here today. So why do we even need guidelines for the documentary waterfall? We did several surveys on sustainability and it is a real issue in documentary film. Although this is considered the golden age of nonfiction filmmaking, there's been a consistent history of documentary filmmakers working uncompensated to get their films made. In those early surveys, we found 19% of documentary producers and directors did not receive a full salary on their last film, and 36% did not receive any salary on their last film. That means 55% of people are going underpaid on working on films that are filling a marketplace. In the past, to make up for shortfalls, filmmakers were encouraged to reduce budgets unrealistically and to work unpaid, often believing they would eventually be compensated by the ultimate sale of their film. But once investments came in, filmmakers were even less likely to be compensated from the sale of the film with proceeds split among investors only. A unique DPA recommendation is that we do not support uncompensated filmmaker work at any stage. This is an unsustainable industry norm that we are working to change. We believe by thinking about how to structure a film's finances from initial budget through distribution of the film's profits, there are multiple opportunities to rectify the tension between maintaining affordable budgets and filmmakers being paid properly. These guidelines also offer greater protection for investors and donors, ensuring filmmakers are deploying investments and revenues responsibly with common industry standards in mind. DPA has worked in conjunction with investors and donors for feedback and they've been very receptive. This is not an adversarial relationship and we wanna stress that. We have at times heard from investors coming in saying that 
filmmakers are presenting the guidelines in a demanding way that these are the new guidelines, but this will be a losing proposition for everybody, for filmmakers and for financiers. This is the start of a conversation and we hope a long and vibrant life together making important work. Remember, it's hard for some investors right now, especially in the wake of COVID, COVID and mutual patience is gonna be important on both sides. Keep in mind this document emphasizes best practices rather than requirements. And please note, and this is important, that not all films are suitable for, for investment. Some investors may prefer to donate or funders may prefer a more traditional tax deductible donation model that is aligned with their goals and is an easier way to support a film. Ask, maybe the people coming to support your project don't know about donations. Um, okay. I also, we also wanna say as we dive in that we are ambassadors in this work. If you're approaching a new financier, whether an investor or a donor, they may not be familiar with these terms or the way to work in the documentary world. So this is our chance to educate. Um, the more we, the filmmakers, frame it as the start of a conversation, the more room both you and the financiers or investors will have to share what does and doesn't work for them. It may mean you won't get all of the recommendations, but we will let, you'll be well on your way to getting some and to being in a productive relationship that is hopefully mutually beneficial for a long time to come. Okay, so keeping in mind that paying filmmakers for their work at all stages of filmmaking ensures a diverse range of experiences and perspective and enhances the landscape of documentary film and equity and inclusion. The guidelines were developed to encompass a range of funding scenarios and may not, may not be relevant for every project, but the concepts are helpful for everyone to understand. And this document will not teach you how to negotiate your financing deals, but it gives you the tools and concepts to enter into negotiations with confidence and flexibility. You won't get everything you ask for, but with a deeper understanding of these terms and concepts, you'll be a better negotiator. And lastly, and always, please contact your own entertainment attorney before finalizing any agreement and before signing anything. Keep in mind, some of these points might be new to the attorneys too. Feel free to send them this document so they can benefit from reading it. Okay, now on to the concepts. So as filmmakers, we need money to make our films. So let's go over the two types of documentary film funding. Funders are either A, an investor, which means they may get a contractual financial reward, or B, a donor, which means there's no contractual financial reward. Let's go over the recruitment graph. We created a graph to foster a common industry understanding of all of these terms since each impacts the waterfall differently. So if we look down the left side as we go through each type of funding, on the investor side, filmmaker cash or producer's cash advance. These are out-of-pocket monies contributed to the film by the filmmaker during development. Examples are uh, R&D, trailer creation, location scouting, etc. The preference is to include these costs in the production budget to ensure repayment. The next is the loan. This is a financial interest that requires repayment often with interest paid in addition to the amount, original amount borrowed. So if the loan was $400,000 with 5% interest, then 5,000 would be paid back in addition to the $100,000 loan. Next, we're gonna look at investment. A traditional investment is financing that requires the following. A recoupment of ori the original invested amount for example, a $100,000 investment expects $100,000 to be recouped. A premium, which is an additional percentage of money paid back to the investor on top of the original amount. So for example, if the premium is 15% and it's a $100,000 investment, the premium would be 15,000 paid on top of that amount. And also net profit participation if the film exceeds certain income thresholds. Let's note, there's a trend now with grantors who are starting to insist on recruitment as well. This is not ideal for documentary filmmakers. It means less of the financial reward of making the film will go to the filmmaker. Very often, recoupable grants turn out to be the same thing as an investment, and it can complicate your deal making and frustrate investors. So when you are made an offer by a funder, whether investor or donor, look at this chart and be clear what obligations come with that money. 
By the way, the chart is part of the waterfall guidelines document. So you don't have to take a picture of it. It's up on the web as part of the, um, the document. So here are two examples um, of recoupable grants. Uh, one is a recoupable grant with no premium. This is the same as a no premium investment. This grant may require share of net profits to be paid to the grantor investor if the film succeeds commercially. The next type is a recoupable grant with no net profit participation, which is the same as a no back end investment. This grant may require a premium to be paid to the grantor investor if the film succeeds commercially. For a time, grantors were switching to a recoupable model because they could not support for-profit filmmaking. And even they didn't know where they were supposed to recoup in the waterfall. Since the guidelines released, however, several funders have clarified their recoupment terms, which is a good development. Finally, on the donor side, there are two types. There's a grant, which is funding provided for philanthropic reasons, typically by a nonprofit organization that does not require repayment. When cultivating new funder relationships, always ask if a grant would be possible. It's less onerous on all parties and they get the tax deductions. The other type is a donation, which is a tax deductible gift by individuals through a fiscal sponsor re-granted to a film that does not require repayment. Now onto budgeting, which is a key part of this overall discussion. So the budget is the bedrock of, of funding relationships. It's what we send to financiers to help them understand what it is we're trying to create in financial terms. Um, for budgeting guidelines, it's essential to create a realistic estimated budget with reasonable wages for all. Make sure you research all of the numbers in each line of the production so it reflects the true cost to produce your film. We have found many investors are happy to receive a realistic budget, but they don't want people coming back a second and a third time realizing that they underrepresented. This is not a time to lowball. You wanna present a realistic budget. If you need to hire someone with budgeting experience to come in and create a realistic budget, do that because this is the bedrock for the relationships you're about to forge. And it's, and it's the key to making sure your film can be made in an efficient and timely way. So a few important things to discuss when including, when drafting your budget. It may not contain all of these, but you should be aware of them. And many of them are gonna factor in once we get into the waterfall. So make sure to define the scope and term of work on contractual obligations. So for example, let's say in the original budget, the producer fee covered all of the producer's work until the film's festival premiere. If after the premiere, the film gets a new distribution deal, deal and new deliverables are required to fulfill that distribution deal, um, that would be outside of the original scope of work and would need a new budgeted period and new contracts to be negotiated with the people who would need to fulfill that work. The plan would be for the, that work to be covered by the income from the sale of the film. The DPA is currently at work on a set of labor and wage guidelines. So please stay tuned as we begin to understand how to budget for people, um, particularly on the producing level. Filmmakers cash or producers cash advance. So this is the, the name that's been given to the out of pocket expenses and development costs like research and development, trailer creation, travel that filmmakers often bear before they've raised any funding. Um, in order for those to be reimbursed, you wanna include them in the estimated budget so that they can be repaid in first position before any additional production commences. That means keep track of the expenses that you've paid, keep financial records. Those will become essential when trying to negotiate investor deals and establishing how much money of your own you've put into a project. Budget contingencies. This includes, this is included on the top sheet of the budget and is typically 10% of the direct costs. So you can cover unforeseen overages, which happen in documentary film. And that's no indication of a lack of good producing. Documentaries are capturing the unknown. So 10% contingency often helps us in those situation, situations. Oh, um, additionally, there are some budgets that may have an overhead or production company fee. This is also included on the top sheet of the budget. It is also typically 10% of the direct costs to cover monthly and annual overhead like office rent, accounting fees, utilities, 
Um, you can also include these as line items within the budget. Again, the upcoming DPA wage and labor guidelines may address these overhead and production company fees for the purposes of the waterfall guidelines. We were working with the industry norms at the time. So keep, keep abreast, it may, things may change. Um, please note that often investors and distributors have an issue with both a contingency and a production company fee in the budget. The DPA believes both should be included as an industry standard and is continuing to advocate for that. There are real costs with housing your production, with housing and edit room, with paying for insurance to protect the masters and your crew. And so we believe that the 10% contingency fee is separate than the production company fee and the overhead expenses. Remember also any, any pushback is a chance to negotiate. Um, if you don't want a production company fee, you can ask about adding the line items to the budget for your overhead expenses. If we can't include the R&D costs, when is it that we can pay those costs back since those were hard cash laid out in the course of making the project? These are all opportunities to continue the conversation. Remember to include distribution, deliverable, and festival premiere costs. You wanna make sure to budget for deliverables to festivals, distributors to um, distributors who may have different deliverables than a festival, uh, foreign sales companies that may have different deliverables than, than US sales company. We encourage the budget to include travel and lodging for one US and one international film festival premiere for mutually agreed upon personnel since festivals are often an important part of selling a film in the marketplace. In fairness to investors, we believe premier festivals should be paid, but overall expenses should be capped. So you might agree that it's two people going to the festival, the director and the producer involved in directly selling the film. We believe festival and publicity and promotion expenses should be included since they increase the profile of the film in the marketplace and hopefully attract a better buyer. If an investor disagrees with certain expenses in your budget or asks to remove them, say the festival expenses, you might agree to take them off the top. All of these terms we're gonna to get to once we get into the waterfall. But again, we're just trying to offer you ways of thinking about if not this, then maybe that. Completing the production budget. You can stipulate in your investment agreements that the full agreed upon budget must be completed before any party begins recoupment. In that way, if you don't raise the full budget for the film, the first monies in from a sale can go towards completing the full budgeted amount and therefore paying everyone's budgeted fees. This is not an outrageous ask. If an investor balks at this concept, you can deploy some of the steps we'll discuss next. But we have found many investors are quite happy to have a realistic budget as the bedrock of their investment, investment and their investing contract and will honor the, the budget that's been agreed upon. So now that we've discussed the difference between investors and donors and various recruitment models and the importance of budgeting costs, it's now time to discuss the waterfall. The waterfall refers to the flow of gross revenues that a project receives and how these gross revenues or the pie are distributed amongst those with a financial interest in the project. Basically, it's who gets paid from the film's revenues and when. Gross revenues are the monies paid to the film, such as broadcast deals, theatrical rentals, streaming platform licenses, VOD, international sales, et cetera. So this is the money coming into the waterfall. Now we'll move on to the monies that go out of the waterfall. These would include repayment obligations to investors, including the filmmakers and donors if required. The waterfall is often discussed in terms of the position, first position, second position, et cetera, in which each, each investor donor is paid back. Thus, they are like parts of a waterfall as it cascades downward. Keep in mind that how much investment financing to take on and how the structuring of those deals impacts the potential for an investor to make their money back and can make an investment more or less appealing. There's usually an equity or investment cap, which is the maximum allowable investment on the film project to protect the investors and make sure there is a strong expectation of repayment. It varies by year. Um, what are the things that you consider? Is Netflix buying? Are they full up on originals and therefore um, there's no um, big competition? That will all impact the sales potential for a film and will dictate how much of the budget can realistically be recouped. This is decided, this uh, cap is decided with your investors. 
The, the total investment to take on for your film will be impacted by the overall budget and also pre-sales, general market conditions, and the film's overall distribution and impact strategy. This needs to be figured out at the beginning and can be discussed with your prospective investors as well. For example, let's say you've raised all of your investment financing on the project and have met your equity or investment cap. Then during post-production, an investor wants to come in, but it will exceed your equity cap and therefore dilute the early investor's investment. If you want to take this funding, you'll need to go back to the other investors to get their permission. They don't have to agree, but you can make a case as to why that funding is critical to the film. Before we move on to the final section of this presentation, we want to explain that the DPA believes in fair recruitment and profits for all parties in the distribution of revenues in the waterfall. We work to weigh various competing financial interests so that everyone benefits from the film's profitability. We believe fairness and transparency will be mutually beneficial to investors and filmmakers and will lead to long-term financing relationships. Now we'll talk about the waterfall positions. Please keep in mind that these positions only happen after the payment of all costs to, make, to actually make the film. All of this is open to negotiation. But what is most important for you to understand, it's most important is for you to understand all aspects of the waterfall so that you can negotiate what is best for you and all of the other investors and donors as you make your various deals over the lifetime of the project. The concept of the waterfall and the positions pay out as funds arrive. So it may take several payments to fulfill all of the obligations in each position. Remember that you must complete one position before you move on to the next one. Keep in mind, this is a theoretical model. We'll go through the first few slides to show the financing, budget expenditures, and sales before getting to the recoupment. As you'll see on the top left, it describes what the phase is. And, and on the right, you'll see that it describes what our cash flow is. Our total budget is $1 million. So we have $500,000 in investment and we have $500,000 in soft money. So we have in the green, the money in. So we have $1 million in, in money in. Here we have our production expenses. And this is, in our example, $1 million. It includes all budgeted production and post-production costs, above the line producer director fees, paid and deferred, and contingency up to 10%, also any deliverable and premier costs. So as you see on the left, uh, we have the phase, which is production budget. On the right, we're down to zero because are we had a million dollars in and a million dollars out. So here we're moving on to the next phase, which is gross revenues. We have international revenues in our example. We have educational and DVD revenues, and we have domestic VOD broadcast and theatrical, which includes our, our streaming deal. We are at a million dollars in money in. Marilyn in a, in a minute is gonna get into describing off the top um, expenses, but here it is on our graph. Um, international sales fees, for instance, um, we're estimating those at 25%. Educational and DVD sales fees, which we're saying is approximately 50% cost, and sales fees uh, from our VOD and broadcast sales are estimated at 10%. So our off the top expenses bring down our cash available to 878,750. Here is first position. We have off the top distribution expenses. We have global expenses, which includes a CAMA, legal fees, film premiere, festival premiere, travel and lodging, distribution expenses, festival publicity, and any unpaid budgeted fees. And that brings us down to 778,750. And Marilyn's going to, in our, in our next uh, uh, section, describe exactly what that is. But um, in terms of our graph, uh, in first position, we have global expenses, which includes a CAMA, 
legal fees, uh, film uh, premiere, uh, festival premiere, travel and lodging, distribution expenses, festival publicity, uh, and any unpaid budgeted fees. And that brings us down to 778,750 uh, once we've, uh, we've taken off all of our off the top uh, distribution expenses. Next slide, please. Oh, actually, so I think I'm gonna jump in here. Oh, um, did I? Um, that's okay. Oh, so Go ahead, so, please. So, um, so coming here just to talk a little bit more about these unpaid budgeted fees. So these were the expenses we talked about as coming off the top. So, if, so in a situation where the investor maybe said, I don't want your festival fees to be in the production budget, we, one might negotiate to say, okay, well, we'd like our, the festival expenses to come out off the top. This is in the first position that we talked about. So before any of the money that's remaining since the sales agent was paid, so from the 878,000, we're saying there's still revenue here. Let's use that to cover the expenses that have gone unpaid. And that includes any fees filmmakers might not have been paid that are known as deferred fees. The DPA believes that filmmakers should be paid back in first position as revenue is available to any unpaid fees for people working on the creation of the film. And this goes back to our original premise of nobody should work on a film unpaid. In addition, we're just lining ourselves up with other places that have negotiated that it is in fact appropriate for them to be paid off the top, which includes guilds and unions and legal fees for attorneys and fees for sales agents and distribution agreement deals or deliverables. Everyone has agreed those need to be paid. And so the DPA is simply stipulating that the people who worked on the creation of the film should also be paid. It's worth mentioning something called a CAMA, a collection account management agreement. And in the CAMA, what you're doing is you're hiring an accountant to take all the investor agreements to understand what the waterfall will be and to to be the accounting firm that shows the revenue in and provide accounting statements and payments and revenue back out to the investors. They take money off the top. Different cameras work in different ways, but they do take some funds from that money to pay the investors their fees. And so some investors do like having this third party represent them with a camera. In addition, we believe preferential loans and the filmmaker cash or producers cash, the money that we put in sometimes in the R&D phase that an investor might ask to be removed from the production budget, we might ask for that to be included here in first position in the off the top expenses. So again, always a point of negotiation. If not in the budget, then where can we put it? Capped festival expenses would belong in this section. So if they didn't put your festival expenses in, let's take it from the sale. And any new expenses to, to complete a sale, if a, there's a broadcast cut down that requires new music or a new sound mix, all of those fees would come off the top from the funds from the sale. In this second position, we're gonna take a minute um, to learn a little bit of Latin. This second position is paid out what's called pro rata pari passu. So pro rata means proportionally between relevant parties and pari passu means with equal step. So for contract purposes, it means equally between relevant parties. So pari passu means proportionally at the same time. So another way of looking at this is everyone is paid the proportion that they are owed and no one is paid before all of the others in that category. So for instance, you may have two investors, one gave $100,000 and one gave $50,000. If you only have $100,000 to pay out at the same time, then the $100,000 investor will get 66% of the monies coming in and the $50,000 investor will get 33% of the 100,000 coming in proportionally to what they invested at the same time. And until both the $100,000 and $50,000 investor are paid back, you would not move to the next phase of the waterfall. That is what pro rata pari passu means. So included in this second position are investor principal recruitments. So an investor who gives $100,000 will get their $100,000 back in this period. Some recoupable grants, if they've stipulated to recoup in this first position, um, some recoupable grantors have now reaffirmed their position that they only actually want to recoup once you're in net profit. So we were able to, some funders, once they understood the waterfall better, uh, were able to move themselves out of second position. Non-preferential loans, since loans require repayment and are, and are obligated to repay regardless of whether the film is successful, would be paid back here. Unpaid budgeted fees also known as deferred fees or filmmakers cash advances, if they were not recouped in the production budget, 
and then they were not recouped off the top in first position of any sale, then they would move to second position. I'm about to begin uh, another of the DPA unique recommendations. This is an example of sweat equity, right? What we say when we say we put our sweat equity into the film. So let's say an investor wants you to wait to get your deferred fees until second position. The DPA recommends you then become an investor in the project just like them, and the deferred fee is now entitled to receive a premium and or net profit participation just as any other investor who invested in the project. If they don't wanna share a premium or net profits on those funds, then it should be paid in first position. You should not have to wait to get paid back until the investor line if, they're, if you're not also going to be inured all the benefits of being an investor. This is an example of how you can use this as a negotiable point. Another unique DPA recommendation is to make sure that all parties are entitled to recruitment at the same position and all are repaid at the same time. You wanna keep it as fair as possible. There will be pressure from certain investors to jump ahead of others saying, I won't take net profit if you pay me in first position or I'll skip my premium if I get paid out before other investors. The problem is it's frustrating for investors and then challenging for producers to structure those kinds of preferential deals. Investors don't wanna be second in line if other investors are gonna recoup in full before. So in an effort to be fair to all investors, the DPA is advocating that every investor be paid pro rata pari passu proportionally at the same time. So in third position are premiums on investments. So if an investor stipulates that they get a 15% premium, what they're saying is that if they've given $100,000, for example, which they recouped in second position, their premium will be recouped in third position. So the 15% of the $100,000, which would be another $15,000, would be recouped in third position. If you remember the chart from earlier in the talk, recoupable grants, some of which participate in premiums. So they're a grant, but they're expecting to be paid back and they in fact get a premium, which is why we wanted to make the point of saying a lot of these are similar financial structures, even when they're called different names. So you have to be very clear about what offer is being made to you as you accept your financing. So you're sure that you're administering this in the fairest way possible and in a way that allows you to continue to raise money for your film. Another unique DPA recommendation is to incentivize investors to come in as early as possible by giving them a bigger premium than an investor who comes in later. So for example, if an investor wants to invest after a film premiere has been confirmed, it's a less risky investment than one made during research and development. The earlier should get a higher premium of up to 20% and the later investor a lower premium of 10% or less. I will just add that you'll see in the guidelines that we are offering a range of premiums. And that's because we do understand that some investors bring more than simply financing to a project. Some will bring distribution deals, will help with sales agencies, will help with the publicity and promotion. And so we offer a range because each investor should be presenting to you the full slate of what it is they can bring your project. And we want to honor that sort of commitment to a project. That's what we believe the premium should be used for. So let's talk about the terms front end and back end. Front end is when costs are paid off before net profits. Costs such as budget line items, off the top costs, recoupment of capital, and premiums. All the positions we just discussed. The back end or net profit participation happens as the, as the last step of the waterfall after all other costs are paid. These profits can also sometimes be referred to as points. Each point is worth 1%. So there are two pools of money for net profits. We have the filmmaker pool and the funder pool. The filmmaker pool is 50% to the filmmakers. So the filmmaker pool is automatically 50% of 100% of the back end profit. Sometimes this is called the creative share. Note, the DPA is following the standard US model that allocates 50% of net profits to the filmmaker pool. The European model and other international models may differ from this model. So adjustments may need to be made if international co-producers are involved. Also, some film teams will distribute the filmmaker pool, also known as points, to other members of the creative team. Points can be used to boost lower than normal crew or vendor rates. There's no set standard on how or if to distribute profits to other team members, but please make sure to honor any contractual promises to crew regarding back-end participation. 
we found that this was news to some investors we spoke to. They perceive the filmmakers keep all of the 50%. Um, beware of some investors who tell you which expenses are allowable for off the top deductions and the rest they expect to come out of the filmmaker share. Make sure to check the fine print of your agreements. The remaining 50% is the funder pool. And that goes to those who are invested and entitled to back-end participation. Fourth position, pari passu, is net profits shared between the funder pool and the filmmaker pool. And also in fourth position are recoupable grants that participate in net profits. This is the final unique DPA recommendation to help with filmmaker sustainability. If the filmmaker brings in soft money, which is another term for grants and donations, for instance, we recommend it count as part of the funder pool resources. And we believe it improves the investor's position because there are fewer people in line to be recouped. Keep in mind that this is not something that has been common in deals in the past and may be new to some investors. For back-end net profits, this is now our financial summary. The filmmakers, received 101,875, that's the filmmaker pool, plus 50,938, which is the soft money share of the funder pool for a total of 152,813. The investors received 50,938 in net profits, in addition to their initial investment of 500,000 in second position and a premium 75K in third position. So in total, the investors in this case received $625,938. One last thing to help clarify recoupable grants. We recommend recoupable grants be recouped in second position pari passu with investor recoupment and filmmaker sweat equity recoupment. But since the grant needs to be paid back, we feel the grant amount should not be calculated into the filmmaker portion of the funder pool net profit split, meaning the filmmaker would not get to net profit participate on that particular recoupable grant amount. As funders make their grants recoupable, it's worth letting them know how that might impact filmmakers, since taking money from filmmakers will often go against their final mission of filmmaker support. It's on each of us to educate them. As a reminder, 50% of this budget was raised through investors and 50% was raised through grants, which is why the filmmakers are taking a portion. They get the soft money pool of that back end. This is one of the, the DPA recommendations that has gotten the most pushback where investors do feel that if filmmakers are already getting paid on the project, why are they also getting the filmmaker percentage of back and why are they also taking the net profit split for the soft money? We have encouraged them to, to understand that independent filmmaking requires not just the skill set of producers who are getting paid a weekly salary of creative work of producing a film, but we've added on to that being able to sell a film and finance a film. And so those skills are what we're looking to help remediate where the budget can't bear it by being able to participate more fully in the back end of the, of the net profit. It's worth noting, we're not gonna get all of these guidelines taken um, on the first, first pass. And so this is a place for you to be an ambassador again, to explain why it is important for you to have a soft money contribution for the work that you've done to help further the project so that they did get a better return as an investor. And we also encourage investors not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. If this guideline is a tough one for them, Let's go with a different one. There's still four others that are really good ideas that they could make use and would make a meaningful difference in our work. So with that, going over to the other best practices worth keeping in mind, please consult entertainment attorneys and accountants. If you've understood nothing else, give this document to your lawyer and they can write a contract that reflects these values. These are legal documents with fiduciary responsibility. Often the producer bears, bears fiduciary responsibility. Please seek entertainment attorneys. We recommend on both sides, both the film investor and the filmmaker seek uh, advisors with film investment and financing experience. Um, everyone should find peers to help mentor them um, or to pay peers to help them understand the process. Um, it'll build a stronger relationship for everybody and help everyone negotiate terms that feel fair to them. 
communicate clearly with your investors. Fundraising is challenging and many documentaries filmmakers feel desperate for funding. And so they may be hesitant to ask the important questions for fear of feeling like they're gonna jeopardize the interested party. We've told investors who know this is a hard time for filmmakers to be open to questions and that they too should feel that they can ask honest questions. This is the start of a relationship that we host hope will last a really long time. So clear communication is gonna be the bedrock of that relationship. Um, consider all potential scenarios. Think about contingencies, including best and worst case scenarios as you move through this process. We all want the win, but what does it look like to be working together when you get something just less than the win? Um, we also know this was a lot of information and so feel free to rewatch this seminar with the guidelines in mind. And remember at the very back of the guidelines in the resource section, there's a term sheet that you can use to help you figure out um, the conversations you wanna be having with your financiers. And finally, and just to reiterate the previous point, um, remember change at every place in the waterfall won't happen overnight. But if each of you here can get even one of those guidelines written into your next contract, and then we can share this information with more people, we'll begin to normalize more equitable agreements and the season of change will be upon us. So um, remember you are stewards of the DPA message and good name. And so encourage yourselves and others to be fair to investors and funders, to lead with transparency and openness and invite them into our bold world and teach them that the makers are as important as the films that they make. Um, okay, I think that brings us to the end of this portion and we would be, we'll be taking questions. One thing, if I may, if you're watching this and uh, you are not a DPA member, um, please consider becoming a member of the DPA. Uh, you can check out uh, membership applications uh, on the website. Thank you. We do often get a question that's worth um, noting. We've often been asked how ITVS works with the DPA waterfall guidelines. Um, at present, the ITVS agreements are not in compliance with the DPA waterfall guidelines. ITVS insists on recouping ahead of all other investors. They do not allow filmmakers to complete the budget from the gross revenue of a film. They do not allow filmmakers to pay themselves deferred fees to name a few. Um, the DPA is in conversation with ITV, ITVS, which is the, um, the arm of PBS that allows independent makers to make films and have license agreements with PBS. Um, and so we are in conversation in various areas, including around crediting. Um, and I, we, since we are the makers, uh, we do encourage filmmakers who are going into ITVS negotiations to bring up the DPA waterfall guidelines and point out areas where it would benefit um, the film team to have different rules than the ITVS stipulated agreements. And again, maybe the season of change will be upon us if we each continue pressing for why these are so important to filmmaker sustainability. There's a question here whether Vision Maker Media is in the same boat as the ITVS agreement. The, the ITVS rules are governed by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And so one can assume the rules will be similar across the board. There's a question here about um, whether you have examples of investor slides about the waterfall. I do know that Sundance Catalyst coaches the filmmakers that go through their program quite heavily, and they have a number of resources that they use to help present the films. Uh, maybe it's possible to see if Sundance Catalyst would have a resource, or maybe it's available on the CoLab website or through another Sundance resource. The um, Doc Society uh, toolkit has a lot of really wonderful resources about um, you know, the impact of the documentary films that they've, um, that they've supported. And um, I have personally used uh, some of these slides as models for um, it, it showing investors what the impact can be. Um, of the films that they're about to invest in. Uh, so I, I, I do recommend, uh, it's not exactly what you were looking for, but it is a really um, valuable and, and, and kind of slightly hidden resource that I would recommend, the toolkit. Speaking of resources, can uh, the two of you talk a little bit about who was consulted as you built these waterfall guidelines? We actually spent 
we think it's about four years building the guidelines and it went out for many reviews um, to uh, investor consortium, to individual investors, to accountants, to lawyers. Um, we have been, and, and actually if you look to the very back of the waterfall guidelines, you can see who has signed on as endorsers or otherwise provided consultation support in the making of the guidelines. So we were weighing, we were trying very hard to weigh the health and welfare of the field at large. Um, this was not uh, trying to come from a filmmaker centric position only. Impact Partners has decided to use these guidelines as they work with investors. Catalyst hosted a forum to educate their investors along with Impact Partners so they better understood what it was that filmmakers were kind of up against and looking for. Um, and so I think, you know, and, and we're hearing now that they're making their way. I think many lawyers have been sent them now by DPA members to include in their contracts. And so more and more, I think there are contracts coming out that have these as the sort of the first shot over the bow. It's like, how do we make this compliant? It's worth also noting, because um, we didn't say it already, you cannot take these, this document and give it to an attorney and say, give every, every recommendation, build that into an agreement, because many of them are, if you can't have this, you're going to try for that. And so they're not, they're not, um, clauses or, or, or requirements that could live together. So just keep that in mind. You're not gonna get like, there is a DPA agreement and this is what it looks like. Um, but we have had a pretty wide, um, we've tried to educate and had pretty wide uptick in terms of who's looking at them and who understands that they exist in the world. I know Susan, you've had other experiences also in terms of who's using them. I, I think Marilyn mentioned at the end, we, we would, uh, at, at the end of the presentation that we would, we would love your, um, you know, kind of your experiences as you go out into the world um, and, uh, you know, to, you know, share your, um, uh, you know, we will hopefully have some case studies in, in the months to come, um, but, uh, you know, um, we would love for you as you um, bring your projects using the guidelines um, out into the world, uh, what what your experiences have been for your investors and, and for the filmmakers. It's like television, it's a one way street. Until you bring it back to us, we don't actually know what happened once they went into the world. <laughs> If you're giving a percent of revenue to a protagonist as a part of the waterfall, where does that belong in the waterfall? So this is a new and emerging conversation in documentary, or it's been around for a long time, but it's finally gaining traction. Do you or do you not pay protagonists for the making of the film? On the journalism side, they say, if we pay people to be in these projects, we're incentivizing them to make choices that may not be in their own interest because they may be they may need the financial. Yes, this is in the doc ethics camp and the DPA has a committee for that. Uh, but then there's a movement more and more trying to push against extractive filmmaking saying, if we're making films about the lives of people, um, how do we not pay them as part of the filmmaking process? Um, we have paid people in our, in our filmmaking process after, um, and this, it all came out of the filmmaker share. And that, you know, we were pre-waterfall guidelines and um, it was just a commitment we felt we had made to, to the protagonists. Um, we also insisted that they be paid by any organization for any appearances that they made, uh, like on panel with us, or if we traveled with them, they had a separate daily rate for traveling and separate for travel versus doing it from home. Um, and we insist, we asked for that for them and made sure it was paid, but, um, the percentage of budget that we contributed came entirely out of the filmmaker's share. So I don't know, Susan, if you have another experience. Similar uh, where, you know, it had, it did come out of the uh, filmmaker's share um, of the back end. In, in one case, in another case, um, instead of paying the protagonists um, directly, um, a scholarship, uh, fund was created. So it was sort of like uh, slightly indirect uh, funds to, um, uh, you know, school age children. I would say these are the kinds of conversations that should be raised with investors when you're sitting down across the table from them, if that feels important, or if you're working on a topic that 
really leans into these documentary ethics and issues and how we are not making extractive films, um, bring it up. Maybe it's the kind of thing that you can include as part of the waterfall. Maybe again, there's a corridor that's created um, and maybe it's worth explaining the corridor one more time as it relates to impact for this portion of the recording. So one of the things some filmmakers have done who wanna do impact work is you can create a corridor alongside the waterfall. So alongside uh, first position, second, third, fourth, you might stipulate in your investor agreements that there is a corridor. Think of it as like a channel running down the side of this waterfall where say 10 or 20% of the revenues are automatically being swept into this corridor that then can get funneled directly into the impact campaign or maybe in this case to a protagonist who was really significant to the making of the film um, where we're just sort of stipulating off the top and everyone has agreed, the investors and filmmakers alike, that we wanna mutually agree to support this, this one area of work. And so the corridors have been used to support impact funding I imagine it can be used to, su to support a protagonist um, and, other, and other things that come up in the unique way yeah, we make it, our movies. Right, it could be used to um, pay points to a celebrity who becomes involved um, so that it's, it's more fair um, and it doesn't solely come out of either the um, filmmaker back end or the producer back end, but it's, you know, an uh, corridor that's, that then becomes um, shared. Uh, the, the effect is a shared cost. Here, there's another question. Since docs can sometimes take so long to make, is there a caveat or something other than a flat fee that can be negotiated? So that is something that the DPA Wage and Labor Committee is working on there. We are expecting a set of guidelines to come out um, in the near future. Um, that is, it is a real challenge, right? If a film's gonna take 10 years to make or four years to make, how does a flat fee work for that? And so trying to get more aligned with quantifying the amount of labor and having that represented in the agreement, uh, in the budget is, is something that the DPA is trying to move towards. You can understand on the investor side that it's really difficult that if um, you know projects are going to keep expanding, and sometimes they do, hence the contingency. But if projects are going to keep expanding in scope, uh, at what point you know has the has the scope of the project surpassed the original investor's expectations, which you had signed on and agreed to? And so this is the this is the very real and legitimate concern that everybody has when we and fear people have when they open it up to sustainable wages is what does that look like? It's different for everybody and how do you account for it on each project? So um, it's, a, it's a challenge, it's a challenge to address. Um, but I do think quantifying your work and being realistic, right? If you're gonna make something for 10 years, you're not actually working on it full time for 10 years in all likelihood, you're revisiting it at intervals, you know, once every few months or maybe there's an anniversary or cycling on every year to be realistic in that and represent that, um, you know, and, and articulate that when you're presenting the budget as to why this project uniquely requires this sort of structure uh, for payment for its, its creators. I think those very transparent conversations buy a lot of goodwill because you're also inviting the investor into the filmmaking process and really asking for them to partner with you in making this unique film. And I think a lot of investors, particularly in the documentary space, care about the issues, care about filmmaking, often care about the filmmakers and really want to be a part of a community that's gonna value these ethical practices. So, but, but we have to make it clear, we have to be the ones to explain it. And we have to not view explaining ourselves as um, somehow taboo, like, you know, like we should explain how this all works. It was the making of these guidelines that allowed people to understand why filmmakers were so cut out of the financial viability of their own films. It wasn't understood until then. Can you please talk more about how best to position R&D investment and sweat equity for producer and director? Um, so we encourage uh, everybody to quantify that, right? The more you can say we worked this number of weeks or we did these three research trips, you wanna try to quantify it the same way you'd quantify travel uh, and other hard expenses. Um, we have found that it is hard to get deferred fees in the earlier phases of the project to be included, but some filmmakers have, have um, made their their overall fee inclusive of the R&D period and put that into the original and realistic budget for the project. Uh, if um, investors then say, well, we wanna specifically exclude the R&D period 
and a lot of distributors will do the same. They want to just exclude what happened before they got there. Um, we then recommend that you, because you've quantified that, right, the same way you've quantified your hard cash, you can then stipulate a number and that will give you more leverage to say, well, this is how much money it is we're looking for in first position, um, which would be the kind of off the top way of doing it. I don't want to wait much past the sale of the film. I'm going to take that money when the sales agent gets paid and the lawyer gets paid and the camera gets paid. Um, if, you're, if the investor then says, no, we want you to wait to get paid until we all get paid, all the investors get paid, that's when it converts to sweat equity. And you are then saying, well, not only do we want back the amount that we've quantified as our, as our sweat equity, our labor, our deferred fees, but we also now wanna also take the same premium as other investors on the project and account for that in the net profit participation. So it's actually kind of less expensive to, to, to give the filmmaker the, their deferred fees off the top because you won't, you won't be adding to that the cost of the premium and the net profit split. Um, that, was, that was our rationale for trying to encourage people to pay the makers, the filmmakers, uh, producers and directors uh, at the time that the film was finished the same way they would have expected to have paid all of the costs of making the film. We are um, uh, continuing at the DPA to look at uh, ways in which we can improve sustainability for the filmmaking community. Um, and this is you know, an important step forward. Uh, we look forward to hearing your experiences working with the waterfall guidelines and, um, and any other um, ideas that you might have about improving sustainability and also um, you know, in, in inclusion, uh, which you know, go very much hand in hand. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you.